You are listening to another episode of the Business of Aesthetics podcast series, brought to you by our goal sponsors, MRP, Laser Optech, and Equa Marketing. We also want to thank our silver sponsors, Eilis Works and Pronox. If you would like to network and share your experience with our podcast guests and other aesthetic industry professionals, join our Facebook or LinkedIn communities by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Today, we're going to be speaking with one of the finest experts in aesthetics. Our host's passion led Naren Arul Raja, a serial entrepreneur with 16 years of experience in aesthetic marketing, to co-found the Business of Aesthetics community. Over to you, Naren. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another amazing episode of the Business of Aesthetics podcast. This is Naren, your co-founder and co-host of both the Business of Aesthetics community and the Business of Aesthetics uh, podcast. Uh, first of all, I want to take a minute to thank all of you from across the U.S. and obviously across the world. Uh, without you, we wouldn't have gotten to you know thirty-five thousand plus downloads a month. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing this podcast um, and um, you know um, um, you know sharing your experiences and making our community a vibrant community. Today, I have uh, an amazing guest, a, a plastic surgeon um, who is in the trenches who actually runs uh, a practice just like you. He actually runs two practices. One is uh, uh, OR, and then, of course, he also runs a med spa. Um, So he's in Houston, Texas area. Dr. Patel is with me. Dr. Patel, welcome to the Business of Aesthetics podcast show. How do you pronounce your first name? I just want to make sure that uh, you say I say it right. It's uh, phonetically, it's uh, Situl, C-T-U-L. Thanks, uh, Narun, for having me on the show uh, to share kind of uh, our story and then help uh, other people not make the same mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe um, let's start by talking about, you know, what got you into medicine and specifically plastic surgery, like walk us through your journey. Like, um, you know, how, how, how did all all this start? Yeah. um, So for me, you know, 17 years of training, right. That got me to the end point to start a private practice, but it, it all began, you know, I grew up in a motel and, uh, you know, self-taught myself some programming and also, you know, everything else that followed in terms of going to undergrad and going to medical school. Mainly, it was the variety in procedures and the day-to-day that got me into plastic surgery and the full breadth of treating, you know, kids to, you know, uh, the geriatric population in terms of uh, all the different types of procedures you could do in terms of insurance and cosmetic. Right. So right out of, um, right out of, uh, you know, you finishing your studies, did you work for somebody else or did you like start your own practice? Yeah. So I joined another practice for a short period of time. It just wasn't the right fit uh, at that time. And then uh, I built my practice kind of brick by brick after that. Right. And this was in the Houston area. So you started your yep. practice in seven years ago? Yep. It was, uh, it's been seven years now and started in the Houston area you know, was uh, part of a different practice for about three months. And then, uh, you know, decided that I need to start my own and, and build it brick by brick. Yes. Did you like, like literally rent some space, do your own build out? Did you start from scratch or did you like take over something that was already? Yeah, totally. I uh, started from scratch. I mean, literally uh, we, <laughs> when we, when we decided uh, to start the practice, essentially it was, we met at Starbucks and then had to find some time sharing space. And then from time sharing space, I was on some call schedules and then we slowly, you know, got into our own space and then office shared a little bit and then grew into having our own uh, OR, med spa and two locations. Now. Right. Uh, what were some of the mistakes looking back that you felt you made uh, when you started your own practice? Yeah. You wish you had known back then. Yeah, lots of them, right? But I think one of the biggest things is uh, how important marketing is, right? In terms of if you don't have marketing in place and you don't have a process or something to measure, then you're not managing it at all. And that's one of the biggest things I think uh, I took away, you know, over those these last seven years is how much uh, a role of marketing plays. Because if you don't have people that come in, you can't ever show the work that you do. So I think that's one of the pieces. I think um, in terms of equipment and purchasing equipment, that's always a hot topic uh, when you come out and you're like, okay, well, how can I create revenue that's not just 
off of my hands, right? And so that's where some of the machines and things like that come into place. It's buying them in the right order, um, having a process of who's going to be using them and getting everyone trained uh, to talk about those procedures uh, as well. So it, it all comes back down to marketing and having a plan of like, what is the type of practice that you want to have in five, 10 years? And then planning that out and knowing what steps you have to do to get there. Fair enough. Um, one thing that I have learned about marketing is, um, of course, there's lots of marketing, right? You can do ads, again, you can do yeah. digital, you can do traditional, and then you can do organic. And organic, you have, of course, social media as well as SEO. Uh, what I find is, um, you know, SEO is an interesting game because um, Google makes $224 billion from ads. Uh, that was in 2022. So SEO is what makes people want to see the ads. So SEO is you know, much bigger than $224 billion in value, but it's really hard, right? 5% of the practices get 95% of the traffic. So um, so we have kind of focused on it. And I find, uh, you know, if you are thinking long-term, uh, every successful practice, uh, you know, I've been helping practice owners for 17 years, every successful plastic surgery practice or even dermatology or med spa practice, uh, they have to get around 10 things right. And they have to be really good at those 10 things. Uh, you know, marketing is one of them. And of course, the marketing is, you know, are you getting the best patients at the lowest cost on a consistent basis? Uh, other things you have to get right are like the way you answer the phone, uh, your customer experience, uh, 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 your clinical skills or your team's skills. Uh, you know, so there's a bunch of things. What are some of the things, you know, I know you touched on marketing, you touched on um you know, making the right decisions in terms of those capital purchases in the right order. What are some of the other critical things looking back you feel a practice owner has to get right if they want to be successful over the long term? Yeah, you have to have the right people in the right seats doing the right job. And so I think that's another critical piece. I think sometimes uh, we tend to um, promote people from within the practice that may not have the skills or the ability to do certain things in the practice. And that's one of the things of having that, that right person in the right place. Um, just as you mentioned of, hey, uh, how you answer the phone call. Well, how quickly do you answer the phone call is also important. How quickly do you respond to leads and get to have them actually come in and do the next thing versus going to the next person on Google, um, you know, down their list as they're doing their search. So I think it's, it's the people that make a, a massive uh, difference also in the longevity of the practice and the, the ease of the practice of, hey, whether you're getting the right people to come see you and the right conversions, or you're creating the right content for the social media pieces and the marketing part that you need to have in place. Right. So if, if, if you could just go back and talk to yourself from eight years ago and shake and say, hey, listen, you need to do this. Like, what were some of the mistakes you made when it comes to people? Or perhaps what are some of the practices you have today that hopefully is make, you know, helping you make less of those mistakes? Yeah, and so I think the, the vetting process in terms of the HR piece is like getting um, getting that part right, right? And that means from the top down, that means you have to educate yourself first before you go and hire other people in terms of what that job it requires and what what lanes you're gonna put in place. Uh, sometimes, you know, we tend to think that uh, everybody can do everything since, uh, it, since that's how we were trained. We we're like, hey, we, you can do all these things and, and all this other stuff, but in your practice, you want to have lanes for people and then have KPIs that hold people accountable. Do your 30, 60, 90 days and then have an evaluation, you know, quarterly essentially is, are, are we on the same page? Is it a win-win? Are we getting our, our um, staff members the goals that they want to achieve in what they think in three, five, 10 years uh, as well? And so I think having those conversations versus just, you know, um, being at the grind and just doing uh, the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, <coughs> It's really important to nurture your your staff. Right. So you talked about uh, both the hiring piece uh, and how you vet people and so forth. Do you use any tools, like any any tests, uh, any any processes that are kind of uh, you know unique or that you found to be effective? Yeah. And so you know we'll use some uh, Myers Briggs uh, tests. We use some personality disc assessment. I think those things uh, help us in terms of navigating what type of personality that we need uh, in the right seat. And that can be from practice manager to uh, front office staff to back office staff. Um, and in the OR and the med spa part, everything requires a little bit different in terms of the feel that you want for your practice. And I think that's the first thing you have to figure out your own identity. And I think that's the crucial piece. 
Right. Did you have any help in this? Like when you started or kind of, you've kind of figured it out on your own, made mistakes, read books. Yeah. Made mistakes, read books, failed forward. Right. In terms of all these things of, of like, okay, well this, this didn't work. What do we do wrong? You know, having a postmortem on the actual process that we went through and where are the gaps and holes, right. Of the actual hiring process and then the vetting process, the KPIs afterwards, figuring out what KPIs were, right? When I first started the practice, I had no idea what these KPIs and stuff were. We didn't really understand any of the business side of what the personnel and the seats uh, need to actually do their jobs and um, do it effectively to make the biggest impact in your community. Perfect. Uh, let's kind of, I'm going to do some rapid fire just to kind of make it fun. Uh, okay. Let's take a bunch of roles and let's look at I'll ask you two questions and, you know, in a, in a minute or two, just tell me, uh, you know, your thoughts. One is who is an ideal, you know, person for this role? What do you look for? Let's say you're an office manager. The second question I'll ask is what is the one or two KPIs you would have them accountable for? Just uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. No problem. And so I think uh, the biggest thing in terms of the... Um, can, can I can I just go through role by role and just, you yeah, just give me... Go for yeah, it. Let, let's start with an office manager. So, yeah. you know... Who do you look for? What, what, what kind of person are you looking for? And what are the KPIs? Yeah, so leadership is one of the biggest things that you need in that role. And then the ability to, to manage, right? And so it's a different, um, a different personality that you need. It's more kind of a, either a mother hen-ish uh, type of vibe that you need to actually help nurture, but then uh, help foster the growth and be able to have you know, KPIs that were for the rest of the team, but then for themselves in terms of, hey, what are the revenue goals? What are the efficiency goals? What are the staff goals? Are we are we doing the right things for each one of the staff members? And then are the doctors also doing the right things in terms of productivity for the practice as a global and as a, a micro as well, in terms of where where is everyone succeeding and where do we need to be driven for? And then having oversight in the marketing as well, I think is also a crucial role for the practice manager because that's the lead indicator, right? And so if marketing is not working, then you're going to have empty clinics and you're going to have empty OR time. Makes sense. What are the other key roles that you you feel are essential besides the office manager? Um, I think the front desk is definitely crucial and the patient care coordinator. I think those, those are the three main roles. I think that you have to hire very specifically for the esthetician uh, role. There's also a whole slew of things that you look for for that piece as well. Yeah, so let's go through these uh, quick uh, four roles. So let's start with esthetician. What do you look for? Any KPIs? Yeah, so esthetician in terms of growth is what you want to. They have one. They want you want to have have a growth mindset because as new procedures come out, new technologies, new skincare lines, you want them to be on the cutting edge because that's how you can offer those things. Um, you want them not to be afraid to try new things, or and then also be able to take time to actually have conversations and curiosity in terms of, hey, how would you look at this? What would, how, what would this pair well with the surgical side of things? What, how could we create a different type of procedure or package that gave the, this type of result? And I think that's the out of the box kind of thinking that you need the estheticians also to be on the same page with. So let's talk about the front desk. Who do you look for KPI? Yeah, so bubbly uh, response time uh, in terms of it being extremely personable. Uh, so we look at response time, their conversion rate from calls to booked appointments. Uh, that's also uh, super critical. And then we also uh, look to see, uh, you know, how many review requests, if, they, if they're asking for review requests and how many of those actually create reviews for the practice over that period of time. And then that's the cool. third, the last piece of that, we look at skincare sales. Perfect. And last but not least, patient care coordinator. Who do you look for KPIs? Yeah, so patient care coordinator has to be extremely personable, right? They have to be able to connect at a deeper level. And this means uh, over the phone, because uh, we have a set process in place. And I've found that every successful practice, you know, has a process that they either call the patient the day before the consult, then they have the consultation. It's the same person that meets with them. And then the day after, and they have to be personable enough to actually remember the story have the conversation to understand the objections, the pain points of the actual uh, patient, and then be able to actually step into that role to say, hey, we're, we're here to help you when you're ready, right? In terms of that piece, but it's, they have to have super high EQ and be super communicative 
in terms of their verbal and written formats. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, let's switch gears. I think many of these roles definitely would relate, you know, would make sense a lot to a lot to a plastic surgeon. Some of them like aesthetician would definitely make sense even for a med spa, uh, you know, doctor. Is there anything unique to med spas that you would also try to create in your team outside of the four roles we talked about? Uh, I think communication between all those four roles is also crucial because there are things that people see differently. Um, what the front desk sees on checkout versus or intake and then versus what the hesitation sees on when they take them back. If there's a process of them walking somebody back that like helps ease someone's anxiety and that messaging and that communication, that's needed right between the team to have that uttermost communication between all the different roles. Makes sense. Uh, you talked about uh, communication. Like, What is your go-to communication methods? Like, for example, you have set meetings, uh, one-on-ones, group meetings. Like, What are the top four or five things you do with regards to communication? Yeah, all of the above, right? So if you don't meet about something, then you can't manage it. Um, and then you can't manage something that's not measured. So everybody comes to the meetings with their KPIs, and those KPIs are what drives the conversation forward. And you have to have a goal for each one of these meetings. So you can have a marketing meeting, you can have a business of the practice meeting, there is a, uh, you know, a, um, a patient satisfaction meeting that we have, and that's between all the roles. Uh, and then there is also a um, curiosity meeting that we have in terms of, hey, what should, what do you think that we should offer that we're not offering uh, in terms of where we want to be and where we want to grow to be? Right. And these meetings, um, are they separate meetings? Are they like a cadence? These things happen once a month. These things happen quarterly. Like, yeah. Just you know, so lay of the land. Yeah. So usually the, the marketing and the business meetings are once a month. And then the um, curiosity question, the curiosity meetings are usually um, bi-monthly. So every two months we have one of those. And then the, the, the team meetings essentially to understand the lay of the land, that's uh, a monthly. And then there's one-on-ones that happen quarterly. And do you do daily huddles? I know some practices believe in that, like you come in the morning and you really think through, like, how are we going to make the most out of today? Absolutely. So daily huddles are super important because that's what helps you move the hunting to-do list, right? So you come up with all these ideas, but we never get around to them. The daily huddles help you to see that there's gaps in the schedule to actually get some of these things done. Right. Uh, let's talk about... Um, you, you kind of touched on um, some of the mistakes you made, uh, you know, perhaps not mistakes, but lessons, you know, of course, le- mistakes are, you know, lessons that you pay a lot of tuition for, right? So oh, yeah. uh, when it comes to equipment, right, I know that's a slippery slope, a lot of doctors go down and end up uh, really being upside down, um, like mm-hmm. partly because either they're over committing and they have this fixed uh, monthly bill, which is the payments yep. that they have to make. And partly because uh, they haven't really thought through how to make it profitable and they don't have a plan and a strategy. Can you kind of get a little bit in depth as to, based on your experience, what are some things that perhaps, uh, you know, you would tell yourself, the younger self, in terms of how to go about it? Yeah, I think you have to have a critical mass to purchase a machine. It's not going to be the other way around. And I think that's the piece of marketing when these... uh, vendors come at you and they're like, oh, well, if you add this to your your practice, you're going to make this, this, and this. Well, if you don't have that patient clientele and you don't have the right people, you'll never make this, 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 right? Like it won't happen. So you actually have to, like, if I had to go back and tell myself and whisper in my ear to say, hey, listen, if you don't have this many clientele for this type of procedure, don't buy the machine, right? Like that's just, um, you know, goes in hand. Um, At, you know, at a period of time, we were sharing office space with an OBGYN that did hormone therapy. Well, since hormone therapy, they end up having hair growth. So having a laser hair removal device was crucial, right, in terms of us, because we had a pipeline of patients that would automatically feed into it, right? Um, But in some of these other um, type of machines, it just depends. You have to have the right clientele, and you can survey your clientele to say, okay, what are people asking about? What are people looking for? Right. And doing a little bit of market research before jumping on the newest and latest uh, you know, device is probably the other thing. Makes a makes ton of sense. Let's kind of go a little bit deep into marketing. So marketing, uh, it looks like you, you love marketing. You love uh, to focus on it. Uh, what, in your experience, provide the best return on investment? Do you have any metrics? And, how, and sometimes doctors 
don't spend enough to get the right kind of patient. So what, what are some of the lessons perhaps you can share with share on that front? Yeah. So with marketing, like, you know, in the first five years, I never had any attribution to revenue. Uh, you know, these marketing agencies would tell me click through rates and impressions, and it was really hard to figure out what part of it was working. And so that's where, you know, we, we had to, you know, build out a, a software that kind of helped us to get that transparency to see what exactly was working and what wasn't. And was it our social media? Was it a billboard? Was it something in the mall that we posted? Is it, you know, uh, SEO? Is it a blog? Is it our website? Uh, you know, and it, which ad platform is working well? Is it Facebook or Google, um, Instagram, you know, in, in those pieces? But we wanted to tie it to revenue. And so I think that's the biggest thing of like the takeaway from that is if you don't tie it to revenue, you're really not measuring anything. Right. So I assume uh, we do call tracking, like when we do marketing, yep. um, we do form tracking. So you, I assume you have some way to track where that particular call came from, like what, what yep. drove it. And then, of course, yep. then tie it back and say, OK, this produced $10,000, this produced $5,000 and so forth. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. So and the software does it automatically. So at the end of the month, you can kind of see your live to say, OK, this is how much the, our Google ads are converting in terms of revenue and how many booked appointments that we've had. And then you can see each of the metrics, right? From a lead to a booked appointment, from a booked appointment to a quota patient and a quota patient to a procedure. So you you enter this phone number so the f software integrates with the phone system? Yep. Okay, got it. Um, so it, it so it's almost like, I'm sure you may have heard of Weave. Weave is a, is a tool where it's a phone system, but it's pretty smart. It's intelligent. So when somebody's calling, it'll tell you, hey, this patient owes you 300 bucks and that patient's mom didn't come in they were supposed to last week so it'll give you all kinds of intelligence on the spot is that kind of like what you envision yeah. in terms of a software? yeah so yeah so that's what the, the software does all that and more because it also helps with the marketing it helps uh, with social planners it helps with uh using ai to write a bunch of their different responses the content um the creation and and everything in between in terms of the process right it helps it make it super easy for the the people in the seats so the front desk and the back office it's all drag and drop Makes sense. Um, for the listeners who are just wondering what is the software that Dr. Patel is talking about, uh, he's an entrepreneur. So he, of course, started his uh, pri private practice, two locations, OR and, and uh, MedSpa, but then he branched out. He started doing other things. So Dr. Patel, let me switch gears and let me kind of talk about that urge to be a you know tech entrepreneur, if I could use that term. How yeah. did that happen? When did that happen? Just tell us the story. Like. Uh, Sure. It was it was uh, born out of pain. Right. And so I went through, you know, uh, four or five different marketing agencies uh, and we couldn't get any attribution in that part of it. And we had to piece together, uh, you know, five or six different technologies and nobody would talk to each other. And so I kind of got frustrated in time. And I was like this. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a simpler way. And then we went out and did it. Right. And so that's kind of the, the story behind it to provide the ease and transparency within the practice so it simplifies everything instead of complicating everything when did you launch this product uh, it's been two and a half years now and so we started with our practice initially and then uh you know had some friends that wanted to, to try it and it was super effective and then after that it's grown into a company and now we're at trade shows and things nice nice um, what are some of the, I know this is a totally different ball game than the, you know, being a practice owner. What yeah. are some of the lessons you learned or what are some of the differences in, in running a business like this versus, uh, you know, a traditional healthcare practice? Yeah, I think mentorship is super important um, in terms of you don't know the right sequence sometimes in doing things. And the same thing with a practice. I think there's, there's some commonalities with both of those things. Um, you know, when you graduate from residency, you're left on your own. There's no mentorship. There's, I mean, now there's some, they're starting to have some programs on the business of, of starting a private practice and hiring a consultant in that part of it. Um, and that's the same way with, you know, uh, starting a, a software is in the entrepreneurship is you want to see what other people have done before you. So you don't make those same mistakes. No, it makes, uh, makes total sense. Uh, do you, uh, so you have been at it for two and a half years and uh, so you run both the businesses simultaneously or you have uh, yeah. like you, you're kind of a little bit stepping off of the plastic surgery practice uh, a little bit or how, how is that how is that working from a time like Elon Musk runs seven companies but we are yeah. not all Elon Musk so uh, how does how is it all working out yeah so right now I'm, I'm running both right uh, full steam and so being CEO of both and then 
uh, going from there, I mean, in the future, can I make, where can I make more of an impact, right? And I think the software can make a greater impact because I'm helping multiple practices do what, and do what they wanted to do, right? In terms of the efficiencies that they need in their practice to actually do the right things for patients, the uh, providers, and then the practice themselves. That makes sense. Um, yeah, so uh, tell us a little bit about the product. What does it do? Um, how can people learn about this? Uh, sure. And so, you know, the, the product uh, uses like AI and automations to deliver a process within your practice. A lot of times uh, what, you know, we learned painfully in the practice is that when we had turnover in staff, the process would leave with them. And with that process, uh, that would be the intake, as you mentioned before, of a, like what is the right script to answer the phone calls with? What is the process to get them to the next stage in terms of a booked appointment? Uh, what are the things that need to, to be delivered um, after getting a quote from a patient, you know, to actually have them do the next thing in your practice? And so that is where all the little processes with the different automations of messaging um, that are very specific to exactly the procedures that the patients want that get dripped out in terms of content, but at the same time, we're actually giving you attribution from marketing as well. And so that's the, the, the whole thing. We had to do all the different steps in the middle to get the actual attribution piece, uh, since we do hook up to the EMRs, the electronic medical records. So there's nothing that has to be done manually. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, what is the pricing? How does it work? Like, how does your package um, like uh, cost? How much does it cost? Yeah, and so there's um, there's uh, three different uh, models essentially that we have. One is, you know, some med spas don't want the integration with the EMR. And so we have an affordable model uh, that is uh, more $1,500 a month for the uh, class surgery practices. Our most common one, most popular one is $2,500 a month. And that's with the EMR integration. And then we have one that uses AI to actually feed the data back into the ad platforms when they're running a specific amount uh, in terms of ad money to help optimize the audiences that they're going to run ads to. And that one's uh, closer to the 5K a month. Right. So it's more of a service as opposed to just a software or is it just a software? It's both. Right. And so the thing is, like, we help turn the dials over um, over the subscription time. Right. And so since it's a monthly subscription, there's also client success that helps with showing the different metrics of how you can improve in the conversion rates, whether it's the front desk, back office, messaging, the emails, the, the templates, the, you know, uh, the text message, text marketing campaigns or the email marketing campaigns to help uh, show what the metrics are to then improve every little bit of it. And then how to use AI within the entire process to say, hey, if we change, you know, if, if instead of an email, if we send a text, does this improve our conversion rates and that part of it? And so there's pieces of AI that are, are kind of laced within the entire system in terms of content creation. And then also even in messaging for the front desk, uh, when someone starts a text messaging conversation, the AI can give you suggestions of like what to say back. Uh, how many like full paying clients do you have? I mean, I know you gave it to friends and so forth, but like- Yeah, so we have 20, moment. yeah, so we have 20 clients and from coast to coast. Um, some of our multi-location, we have one private equity uh, that's also uh, using it as well. And so, um, it's, a, you know, we're on this kind of trajectory to help more and more practices out there to help um, optimize their entire practice and help support their staff. So they, the, the staff can actually focus on the patient care portion. Makes sense. And this is all cloud-based. Is it built on Azure or is it built on Amazon Web Services? Yeah, AWS is what it's built on and it's all cloud-based. Makes sense. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap this up? Yeah, no, I think the, the biggest thing, you know, that I wanted to share is that, hey, there's other ways to do it. You need to just figure out, you know, from the people that are above you and that have done it before to not make the same mistakes. And so the big message is like, hey, pay attention to the marketing, figure out what process that you can put in place to your practice so that you can actually have a work-life balance in terms of it. And that's the that's a piece of it. I think with nowadays with digital marketing, everything has changed quite a bit. So there's a lot less things that have to be done manually, but you just have to be open to doing it less manually. Right. I mean, there are some things you have to be careful because, um, you know, chatbots, for example, like uh, ChatGPT will make up nonsense, you know, so you have to know what is, you know, just putting words together versus it's the truth or the correct information. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there's so much more you can do today versus, you know, 10 years ago, even like two years ago. Uh, thanks to technology, like uh, easier, faster, cheaper, and so forth. But you just have to keep 
figuring it out and keep doing it. Um, uh, you are a plastic surgeon. Uh, what is the challenge, uh, you know, selling to doctors, uh, you know, like uh, compared to, I mean, like, what do you know today that perhaps you didn't know? Uh, in terms of selling, in terms of selling to doctors, I mean, I, I'm not really selling anything, right? Like I'm just helping them live a better life. At the end of the day, that's the goal and the intent. I give them value from the demos, from any of the the software, what processes they can put in place just to help them. Um, just because I want them to be there for their patients and their families. And so I think that's that's my mission. My mission is to help, you know, give work life balance to. Uh, you know, to providers, to, to doctors, to practices, to all the above, right? Because you can't be on a one track uh, piece of just doing the practice or else, um, you know, it, it won't work in terms of the overall goal in 20, 30 years down the road. Right. And your sweet spot, it looks like it's, you know, more established, you know, at least a million plus in revenue practices, as opposed to startups and early stage. It helps both, right? Because even in early stage, it helps you run lean in terms of what all the messaging and help to it helps you grow um, the amount of content that you need to put out there. And then since you can make this content once and it can get multiplied thousands of times of when forms come in or when somebody text messages you and, and goes the back and forth conversation about a specific procedure, you have content that you've shot once that you can leverage. So there's a lot of leverage to the, the software um, for the ad vital software. And I think that's the, the piece that is also good for startups and then they can grow into the other packages as they grow and scale. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. I really enjoyed our conversation. As we come to a close, um, is there a way people can get to know you, you know, maybe Instagram or, and, or like any other way to contact you um, and or to, you know, learn more about what you're up to? Sure. So I'm on uh, Instagram at Dr. Sethil Patel. Uh, and then I'm also on LinkedIn at uh, Dr. Sethil Patel. And then our website is uh, advitalmd.com for the software, if you want to learn more about that. And we're happy to share uh, free value that we put on all our social media platforms in terms of helping uh, give you work-life balance in, as a uh, provider. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Definitely, I, I hope our listeners did as well. Uh, you know, you shared a lot of, uh, you know, quick tips on all kinds of things you've learned over the last seven plus years uh, running a private practice. Um, so if you like this podcast, feel free to share it on social media. Dr. Patel will share the, the, the information with you and feel free to share it with your audience as well. And uh, of course, all of you can subscribe. Uh, I know many of you have, and that means automatically every time we publish a new podcast, it'll be downloaded to your listening device. Uh, we are on iTunes, we are on Google Play, pretty much every uh, you know podcast platform out there that's you know popular with um, anybody in, in the aesthetic space. Till we meet again, have a wonderful week and make this week an amazing week. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this week on the Business of Aesthetics podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsors, MRP, Laser Optech, and Equa Marketing, and silver sponsors, Lengia Law, Eilis Works, and Pronox. Would you like to join our growing group of aesthetic industry experts and get featured on the Business of Aesthetics podcast? Or do you know someone who would love to share their strategies for growth in the aesthetics business, providing quality patient care or their clinical expertise? Head on over to www.businessofaesthetics.org forward slash podcast stash show and apply to be featured as a guest on the show remember to subscribe to this podcast on itunes google play amazon music or wherever you listen if you would like to engage with today's or any of our past speakers join our facebook group or linkedin group by searching for business of aesthetics thank you and have a great day